out into something more spectacular than just how it works. But we're not going to get below 140 characters, are we? Because that's really... <laughs> <laughs> Just a reminder that uh, you, can, you can ask us questions via the hashtag, or we also have a microphone in the middle if you have any questions for us. Uh, Al, uh, in working with the other businesses on the strip, do you find that that what you're dealing with with comedians, that that situation is equally as applicable to Roxy or other businesses? Yeah, I mean, all of this stems from sort of, uh, you know, desperation and need uh, from uh, the comedy store. Uh, perspective, I found myself in a, in a situation where uh, the comedy store had been in 10 years of pretty, pretty solid uh, decline. Uh, comedy clubs, I think, in general were, were finding, uh, they, they were having to redefine themselves in the comedy store more so because we were headed by one very powerful individual and one very influential person. And so um, at that point in time, that, uh, that, that was taken away from us. And we, we had a power vacuum that was filled uh, with a lot of random people. And and, uh, and sort of the rug got, uh, got taken out from under us, and we found ourselves, instead of being the top club, which we had always been, we, we were desperate to find people in our room. And so uh, the first thing I did was, well, what's free? How can we get on and how can we help? Uh, how, how can we do something that's free? And we got online, and what happened was I found uh, Nick Adler, who's sitting right there, uh, who owns the Roxy Theater on the Sunset Strip, and uh, we connected pretty quickly online and found that, that we had similar problems. And we realized that, uh, that by working together, we could actually get more done. And we could, we could uh, make it like, yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, what, what we found was that by working together, we could get more accomplished and we could, we could get the, the, a, a, a small slice of that pie you know, that we could share rather than go completely pious. Well, it is, it is all about trying to get revenue. And, and Mark, you've, you've been successful in, in doing that. Yeah, that seems to be some sort of miracle with podcasting. <laughs> uh, the whole, you know, making some money. Uh, it, it's very tricky because I, you know, I'm not only am I not a techie, but I'm not a businessman. I, I never really saw myself as that had any real uh, uh, aptitude for it. But, but what you're presented with is this weird thing where all of a sudden it's like, oh my God. You know, 100,000 people are listening to this, and I'm in my garage doing it, and I'm not making any money. And that's a lot of people to be not making money from. <laughs> um, so on some level, you know, we had to figure out a lot of different ways to do it. We were a listener-supported model, we still are. We then, you know, created a premium site where you can uh, buy certain episodes that are not available. We now have the apps, which, uh, which seem to be working. Uh, live performance of the shows, merchandise, um, and now advertisers. Become, this is the interesting thing about, about podcasting, is that not unlike most people my parents' age, my father still has no idea how to listen to the show, which is good because he's a frequent guest. <laughs> and on the phone, and if he found out and he'd start performing, that wouldn't be good for anybody. But, but as that changes, as it becomes more easy to access, advertisers are starting to come around, and they're, and they're big advertisers. And like Alf was saying, it's a very unique position to be in that, you know, I'm working in my garage, and, and I am the, the boss of my garage. And now, you know, we're, we're getting calls from you know, people that represent uh, either small businesses and on the internet, or we can use a promotion code, or people like some pop records, and then at a certain age, uh, you know, sponsor two episodes. Um, and, and now bigger advertising companies are starting to see, because we, we have something that, that terrestrial radio doesn't have. Delta, Delta should sponsor it. Well, I think they got enough press. <laughs> but, but it's just interesting that you start to realize like there's all these different ways, so there's an excitement to you know, figuring out ways to be fair. Like, you know, I keep the podcast free because I want people to be able to have and I respect that. I don't necessarily have respect for people who when I do try to say, say like, fuck you, man, it's yeah. supposed to be punk rock. You know, it's my life, um, but I still have it for free. It's just figuring out how to do it, and it's been uh, it's been exciting and, and no regret. I think something that has it also I'm sorry has it also had a huge effect on your live performance business. Yeah, well, it's interesting because a lot of people come to my shows. Uh, two things happen: uh, club owners go, "We sold a lot of tickets," and then they usually say, "Well, we've never sold more single tickets." Um, <laughs> so I am reaching out to a certain type of male audience. <laughs> 
that I can't seem to find clients to go with them to see me, but I understand. <laughs> and, and also, yeah, and, and, and people who, you know, most of the people that I have listening to the podcast were not comedy fans. And most of the comics I have on, which are many, you know, hundreds, um, are a lot of them are new comics. And it's, you know, and I'm very proud to be, you know, doing that for the community that I come from. And also, you know, talking to my peers who I may not have talked to, I, you know, because I was sort of a, uh, you know, a hypersensitive defense basketball for a long time. And, and it's helped me, it's helped the comedy community, and it's, and it's introduced literally thousands of people to uh, the world of stand-up as it is now, and I'm, I'm very happy with that. I think commendable, Mark, is how, how uh, what you've done has become sort of the, the, uh, the way to do a profitable po podcast, <laughs> and, and yet still uh, do it organically, uh, without, you know, cynical ways of, of going out there and, and selling out. I just want to make it known that it's not that profitable. <laughs> uh, I'm doing okay, but you know, I still need money. Okay, go ahead. We have a question from the line. So I was wondering, why aren't there more stand-ups on YouTube? Like, there's great bloggers who get literally tens of millions of views a month. None of them are stand-up comics. I would say the immediate quick answer is you don't want to burn your material for free. You're, uh -huh. you're trying to work on stuff and you need to sell it to say Comedy Simple Records. Uh, <laughs> and you, you, can't, you can't have that out there. How do you upload? That's my problem. <laughs> 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 but I would, I would say that uh, just a little bit of material definitely will go a long way because I've seen guys like Gabriel and Pieces who will put a five minute bit out there that'll get a million and a half views. It's translating into a lot of theater tickets being sold. So I think on one end, I understand being cautious of the material, but also give the fans and people out there something to consume that they may want to go buy a ticket to see. Them. Well, I mean, like, some of the bloggers are actually making money. Like, right, I, I think the, the answer to that is YouTube, the reason that the biggest comedy stars on YouTube aren't comedians is because the YouTube audience is skewed much younger. Yeah. Could you imagine if cats could tour comedy clubs? Alf would book them in a second. But I, I know when I, was, when I was in elementary school, uh, junior high, I would come home from school and I would turn on the TV and I would watch TV until my parents got home from work. The kids now, when they get home from school, they just watch YouTube videos. So it's the people who are becoming superstars on YouTube are people who appeal to teenagers and preteens. And they might not be as sophisticated as Stan <laughs> <laughs> the, the and Kuhn. The, the one young comedy star who's come out of YouTube is Bo Burnham. And he also has appealed to a younger demographic, but he's also real. Um, we also have a question from, uh, I hope it helped. We have a question from uh, Twitter, from uh, Flightpath and Y has a question from Mark and Michael. As you get bigger on Twitter, do you feel more pressure to censor yourself or vice versa? Hell no. <laughs> For me, it's the opposite. I almost feel a pressure to be it is the right word, but to really speak my mind almost as a rebellious act yeah. against feeling you know, the pressure of having these people. Uh, and maybe that's just an instinct of a lot of comics where you just feel like, okay, you want me to go this way, I'll go this way. Well, I, I catch myself sometimes self-censoring and then I'm then I'll, and then as, as a reaction then I'll write something horrible. Uh, just, I, I, to. I tend to, uh, to retweet people who are negative. Oh, I do that too. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, but a lot of times like, I don't understand the tone of, of, of tweets, and, and I've hurt some feelings, and then I apologize. My, my, my biggest problem on Twitter is people who say, uh, hey man, you're blowing up my feed, slow down. I, you know, this is, a, in, my, in my mind, it should be a lawless world of anarchy on Twitter. <laughs> and, and anybody who imposes rules on me, then I really go fucking nuts. And I, I tend to tweet in manic outbursts. So, so no, I, I don't feel a pressure uh, other than to continue to put more of myself out. My husband, who's a comedian, he's, he used to blog a lot, and he stopped blogging because he started feeling the pressure that when he put something out there, it had to be perfect or good or ready, and so he started getting into his own head about it. Yeah. So that's why he kind of likes Twitter more now, because it's just short and quick, and it's gone almost immediately. But he hasn't been <coughs> writing as much on, on his blog, and so, yeah, there's a give and take there, but he definitely gets to that too. How long do you still blog now? I don't blog that much anymore uh, for two reasons. One, because I, I used to blog regularly, and it formed the basis for my first book. 
Um, my once Twitter came about, I realized it was a much more effective way of doing what the blog was accomplishing, which was marketing myself. And I wasn't I wasn't just throwing tons of free material out there. The second reason I stopped doing it, well, it, it's related. For the book that I, uh, I've been spending a lot of time writing a second book, and I didn't want to put that material into yeah. the into the blog sphere for free. Yeah. I wanted to. I just took down blog entries. Whenever I got my book deal, I had to take one that's, down. Yeah. That's really the biggest problem for an artist if we're, if we're calling ourselves that. I, the, the, the biggest problem is, is that because people have access to this immediacy of our creativity, <laughs> that they expect us to generate material at the same pace that they can take it, that they can take it in, which is which is insane. Uh, you know, even when I have you know improvisational conversations on WTF or you do things on Twitter, you risk going into an audience and doing a stage version of those things and then going, oh yeah, we heard that already. <laughs> And then you have to say, but not like this, I'm here. I'm, I'm alive and a person. Uh, which, you know, I don't know how long that'll last. I do think that social media must have, one effect that it must be creating, I think it's true with me, is there is an insatiable appetite for content, an insatiable appetite if you're a comedian for comedy. So gone, I think, are the days, and I was never really a part of this, but, but I think. I think there was a time when comedians could tour and or, or just sort of exist with the same act for years at a time. I don't think that's possible anymore. I think you, to be successful, um, there's a constant need for creating new material um, because, because you have so much exposure to those people. Most of are doing like they're trying to, like people like Louis, uh, you know, is very vigilant about, you know, doing a new hour every year to the point where he will literally not do any jokes from the previous year's hour. And you know, and he, he happens to be a, you know, a, you know, a, a warrior prince of the, uh, of the business, and it's, uh, it's very commendable, um, mm -hmm. uh, a, a creative achievement. Um, thanks so much, you guys are doing an awesome job. I'm from a really small town that a lot of good comedians don't come to, and uh, Olaf Tompkins started the uh, Tompkins 300 campaign recently. Mm -hmm. I actually came to, to Halifax uh, last year, and I was wondering if, has that impacted your community at all? Like, do other comedians sort of, are you reaching out to cities where comedy nerds exist that I, like you? I, I, I'd like to do that, but like, it sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> and, you know, there, and I still have some weird, almost romantic vengeance uh, to perform at comedy clubs. Uh, you know, I found that, that that's diminishing a bit after I did the Mall of America room, but um, <laughs> but nonetheless, like there's some things I would like an establishment to do for me, which is you know book the room. Uh, the idea of like reaching out to you know if you can get 300 people to a, a, a fan, then I'm going to be have to like you know I'm, then it's going to be like every three days me going so how are you doing? And, which is not necessarily in a relation, that type of relationship you want to have with a fan because they don't want to see you going, what the fuck, dude? I mean, I thought you were going to do this. And then you, know, you show up and there's 12 people and it's just his family and friends and you have to be like, okay. Um, so that's my fear. So no, I'm not doing that. But I will like him to be getting 300 up there. Oh, he had 300 up there. No, I don't talk about <laughs> Start a question with the world. Can you please say like the movie was in the world? But there's no more competition amongst comedians on the internet for now they all have podcasts and Twitters and everything else. Have you seen much of a backlash for featuring amateurs and not even amateur comedy writers, just amateur witty people on your site? Or no, the opposite has been true. Um, on Witstream, some of the best most prolific and original voices do not come from professional comedians. They come from students or housewives or whomever that we have, or Lisa Cohen, our founder in particular, has really found and, and done a great job of, of discovering these people. We just have housewives. <laughs> oh yeah, I have a housewife. Okay. <laughs>